Tuesday, November 25th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Left 4 Dead. Let's do this. Oh, it feels a long time since we made a show, huh? Oh, yeah, it's been that long. Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing, I got I got a few items to take care of here. Oh, right? do you? Uh, yeah, the first one is that this Thursday, which would have been the next episode, right, was scheduled to be the book episode because, you know... It was... You know, you could have just not said anything and no one would have remembered. No, and but... we could have just said, without any preface, just, hey, and don't forget, the next Thursday show is the book one. But this Thursday is Thanksgiving, so there's, there's not going to be a show. Oh, there might be a show. No. Uh, well, there's probably going to be a show. No. I'll make a show. All right, well, you can make a show on Thursday, but the Thursday after that, so two weeks, which would be, the, I guess, the second week in December, will be the book episode, and the book is, you know, uh, the first book of, you know, well, Earthsea. What, 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 you know, <laughs> you acted like you didn't know. It's the first, uh, you know, Tales of Earthsea, the first book, and... um I, I met. Speaking of that book, right, I met Water is Poison in the City today because his uh, his Georgia Tech marching band is in the Macy's Parade. So he's, ah. you know, and uh, he was telling me how he read the book pretty much on the way here on the bus. It didn't take very long at all. That's why I chose the book because a lot of you people don't read. This is like this is an easy book, like a middle like it's like a middle school kid book. All right, you can read it. It's cheap, it's tiny, it's quick. <laughs> Get the book and read it. I'm going to put the link in today's episode to remind you. And two weeks from now, we will actually talk about this book. Well, if you need a, a, a more, uh, more, I don't know, prerogative, more incentive, I'll warn you. If you don't read this book and you're thinking you'll hold out until the next book, I'm picking the next book. Yeah. <laughs> Take that as you may. <laughs> Uh, second item, right? Because it is uh, Thanksgiving on Thursday, a holiday only United States people celebrate. But uh, I think the United States constitutes the majority of our audience. I am reinstituting my Thanksgiving thing from last Thanksgiving. Send me your cornucopias. Last time I got one cornucopia. It was pretty good. It was an awesome cornucopia. It was like the best cornucopia I've seen in my life. But it was only one. So. Make Yigi Cornucopias for me. I want them. And also, don't... I want your Corpias. Don't worry corn. that these will go into some internet void, because uh, part of the new website will eventually have galleries and places to show off stuff people have sent us. Yes, including a special Cornucopia page. You still have that old Cornucopia. Uh, of course I have all Cornucopias. I am a <laughs> well, collector. you have one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how many I have. And also, <laughs> even if you collect... You can't have all of them. I have Some... every geeky cornucopia worth having. Oh, do you? I do. But I thought you only had one. Uh, that's not everyone worth having. Right, right, right. That so, exists uh, right now. Video games. Yeah, video games. Uh, I don't know. I thought you had some... You, you made like you had this news. You won't tell me oh, what Oh, you want to go to news. I thought you had something to say about video games before news. No, yeah, I'm playing video games. Ah, uh, me too. Mostly NS and Left 4 Dead, and that's it. And, um, and Pycross. Pycross? <laughs> Fucking Pycross. You know, I still haven't even opened Order Ecclesia. <laughs> nah, you know, Chrono Trigger comes out, I think, on... I know, I pre-ordered it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Why? <laughs> I Why did I pre-order that? I don't know. You could have waited. It would have been cheaper later. I've beaten that game like a hundred times. I've beaten it at least two times. I've once on it... regular and once on plus mode. I've got it half memorized. Yeah, I got it half memorized too. Uh, I start my memory only gets fuzzy once he gets to like caveman land. Anyway, the um so check this out. Richard Bartle. Do you know who Richard Bartle is? I have no idea. He's the guy who made the mud, the original mud. Oh. Right? Apparently. Despite making and inventing the mud for all intents and purposes, you know, just as much as, I guess, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he likes playing WoW. <laughs> and that, that alone is shocking. But um, he's talking about the wrath of the Lich King, right? And he put this post up on, I guess, his blog. And he's complaining about this quest early on in the game. And... Basically, it's a quest. I want you kill six snow moose. Yes, kill six snow moose. No, uh, this quest basically is a. It's a pretty simple quest. You know, you take this needling rod of some sort, and you go find this prisoner, and you torture them for information. Basically, you needle them until they tell you what you need to know, 
and then you complete the quest. Congratulations. But, but in Warcraft, wouldn't this be basically you have the needler, you find the guy, you stand in front of him, and like hold down whatever button. That's that's pretty much all you have to do. The what his pro what Richard Bartle's problem. Wait, wait, now there are, one could could guess that his problem is that you're uh, torturing someone in game. Perhaps, but that's not just that's not his only problem. You see, oh, see, because the other way to go would be maybe his problem is that the torture is lame and not realistic. Uh, no, no, no. Um, his, his, the crux of his problem is that you can't decide not to. You can't say, you can't, you know, the guy comes up to you and says, hey, torture this prisoner. You can't say no. It's, it's you either do it or you're stuck and you can't continue. Well, you, that's pretty much the way all quests and all MMOs have always been. You know, that's true to some extent. But the thing is, I think about the old MUDs. Right, the old muds, and even though the old muds, you know, they were no, you know, burning wheel. They, they were, you know, they, they didn't what? have. Some... Usually, the choices if you were on a quest in the old muds was the king is giving you a quest. Do you accept? And if you say no, he kills you. Well, yeah, that was quite often, but there were, <laughs> you know, attempts to give because those things were based on D and D, and there were some attempts to give you choices and things and you know, make things matter. And you had like, you're, you had actually had an alignment that would, you know, change from, you know, lawful to neutral and good, depending on what you did. Well, and you know, even the realm had that. I mean, I remember you, you started out good, neutral, evil, whatever. I picked neutral because if you start, you know, if you go to the one place and kill angels, you become evil. But if you go to the other place and yep. kill the devils, you become good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And if you steal from people, you become evil. And I remember I became evil in order to get the multi-blade, AKA the multi-pass, which was, not nearly as powerful or cool as I thought yeah. it would be once I got it. But th it does make me realize something in that that even that simple, effectively useless, right, you know, alignment decision mechanism that was in the older MUDs is apparently completely non-existent in WoW. And even that all, you know, tiny bit of nothing is better than nothing. <laughs> and it, it is kind of sad. And not only that, but he says... um, you know, what is this going to mean for, you know, on a, on a regular server, people just questing to, you know, advance. No, a lot of people won't even notice or anything, you know, but he's like, on the roleplay servers, what are they supposed to make of this? Everyone is a torturer? Well, from what I've gathered, most of the people who roleplay in games like WoW will basically roleplay among themselves with their own stories just happening to use the kind of world around them. But yeah. they'll ignore the quests and stuff because it doesn't make sense. Everyone did the quest. Everyone's the hero. So, yeah. The other thing is that he says um, the, the the other thing he he that bothers him is that this torture was not. It's not that there's a quest with torture, right? You can make a quest with torture that would be good. You know, with if you had a decision or if you portrayed it in such a way as to make people realize something, or maybe if you tortured and then you know someone came and was like, "What the hell fuck's wrong with you?" Wait, Something maybe, like that. Why couldn't it just be? The moral of the game is that torture is awesome and always gets yeah. you what you want. I mean, <laughs> yeah, good. but, but he says the thing that bothers him the most is that this torture was sort of placed in the game casually as a run of the mill quest with no regard for the fact that that was something that was sort of weird, you know, uh, something uh, that you wait. Know, should... But I point out Bionic Commando back in the day, at one point you find this uh, enemy, this Nazi soldier, and he basically says, I ain't talking to you. And if you rough him up a bit, then he talks to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they added that. I mean, they're they, Atari. They put, I, the fact that they took that and made sure that it was still in the new Bionic Commando. Yep. <laughs> they're like, hey, torture that guy. So you walk in and you just kind of poke him a bit. And then he goes, ah, and he talks. And then you kill him. But I just think it's, you know, <laughs> it's, See, so, it's sort of interesting. Th there's two ways to go. I mean, of course, my ideal... MMO, you know, massively multiplayer online role-playing game, which is not what MMORPGs are anymore. Well, if they ever were that. But imagine a world where you have junctures like that all the time, and you always have all these choices, and not everyone follows the same path. You know, take the, the Oblivion or the Fallout idea of there's a million different things out there, but and, and everyone can take different paths, you know, kind of like a multiplayer Fallout, but with a lot more stuff, and they're not all just fetch quests. And make it so that every decision you make affects your character permanently in some way that's rolled into your narrative. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. The other way is to have it where 
you go one step further, every single quest, every single thing is unique and isn't just creating the character, the narrative for your character. You're creating the world's narrative. <laughs> you went and did this thing. Now the flavor text there or the characters there reflect that. The problem is the former is too difficult for a lot of players and it also, and, but yet it's not far enough for the people who are really into role playing. The latter is in no way economically viable. See, I think really what the thi uh, what could happen here, right, is I, th I was thinking about NS, which is a game we're playing a lot lately. And the thing about NS that's different from every other game that I've ever, that I can think of, right, is that the quests or objectives in NS, they're not like a built into the game kind of thing. It's not like, you know, you play some games and it's like, go here and pull this lever. Like, look at Left 4 Dead. It's like, everyone get in the crane and push the button. That's the quest. It's built into the game. It's a set thing. And NS, as a team or as an individual, you are constantly making quests, making up objectives, but they make sense. You know, it, it, you're, cre you're sculpting the game on your own as a player. So what if you had a game, like if WoW had a thing where, you know, the Horde and ever, they're fighting and you go, like when you can every time you complete these unique quests, they change things in the world on the other side and accomplish But goals. not even, not the quest, there wouldn't be quests programmed into the game at all. You would come up with the quest. You would just do things well, that, that would, you came up with. Yeah, or you know what did that? Other Pla players decided, you know. You know what game did that? Planet Side. Did it really? Planet Side was basically a giant NS in that regard. It was, you know, I'm on this team. Hey, let's all attack such and such. Just go there and attack it and take it. Yeah, I mean, of the course, the game had other problems. Well, though. I, I wasn't. I'm talking about the concept. I mean, if you yeah. want to, if I bring up any game, we we could, of course, talk about what's wrong with it because, as everyone knows, we hate all games. All games suck, except for NS. Except for Tigers and Euphrates. <laughs> except for TD, NS, Tribes Two. That's it. Every other game sucks. <laughs> I would argue, Zelda One. Ah, uh, Zelda Two was better. No, you. What do you know? I know Zelda 2 was better. <laughs> so you, you just said, the translation, you know nothing. <laughs> anyway, but actually, this, it's still, this really plays into what I've always, my whole life, what I've wanted is even a single-player game where decisions matter and you're allowed to lose and the game continues. You know, a branching story where... Our, Dwarf Fortress? But that's not really, a, it's not the same kind of game well, at all. Well, Dwarf Fortress is, is similar in that you have uh, a narrative emerging from your own decision making. I'm talking about but... something as simple as, all right, it's a Final Fantasy-ish game. Go and save the princess. If you make it, you save the princess. Great. Uh, you know, the plot continues. If you fail, princess dies. Game continues to the end. Well, our game continues in some way. Yeah, well, well it ends. All games end. Yeah. Except, wow. <laughs> but, well, I guess if you hit level 80. Yeah, there's only so many perks. times you can kill the exact same monster over and over again, and everyone else also kills him over and over again. But just the idea that losing shit... Man, think about how many times this prisoner has been tortured. But how many games could just do this? I mean, Burning Wheel... Remember we talked in Beyond Dungeons & Dragons about how in D&D, &D, generally when you play Dungeons & Dragons, it is make a test, try, you know, fight, do a fight. If you make the test or win the fight, the plot continues. If you fail at the test or lose the fight, the plot basically stops until you make the test or win the fight. In Burning Wheel, the idea is that, no, if you make the test, you continue to the next test. If you fail, instead of stopping, you go in a different direction with a complication being added. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything you, or everything you do in a game just takes the game in a different direction as opposed to there being a line and you try to get to the end of it. It is, you take a step, and then every time you take a step, you either go straight left or right. And, you know, if you fail, you're going to basically take all left turns until there's no, until you die or there's nowhere else to go. You know, but if you succeed, you're going to go straight ahead if you succeed every time, you know. But if you succeed and fail in different ways, you go straight, left, right, straight, and end up at different places every time you play. And I think if you had a game like Fallout, right, but if you took out the sort of, you know, do this quest here and the game ends kind of stuff, you know, if it was just, here's the world, go, instead of, you know, go get me that water controller chip at the beginning. Well, no, it, it is, here's the world, go, but there's also a way to end the game. Yeah. That's fine. It's okay. The only, I mean, the real problem with those games is that it's most better, of, It's better than torture this prisoner, you have no choice. Well, no, the only problem with those games, really, as I've found, is that there just isn't enough to do that's novel and most quests are effectively the same thing i mean oblivion 
go get this book from this cave. Thank you. Here's some money. Uh, I heard there's another book in another cave. I could give you money in exchange for getting it. Great. <laughs> I, I like I like books. Oh well, this is all all these all this is bit by bit getting rolled into what is eventually going to be the uh, panel we hope to present at the next PAX, which we're still tentatively calling "Losing Should Be Fun." Mm. But anyway, there's this article on Slashdot, and I kind of want to talk about it because these sorts of articles come up a lot. Now, it was how politics interact with games, and constantly in every game. When you play blog, NS, people go blah blah blah, Ron Paul, Ron Paul, <laughs> blah blah blah, Obama, Obama, your mama. But that that's not games. That's the internet. You go anywhere. <laughs> If it, on the, you realize Ron Paul supporters are like random encounters on the internet. Except you know how many times I've gone into the ready room in an NS game and there's someone yelling, like spouting conspiracy nonsense, like <laughs> "Oh man, your evil politicians! They ruined your economies. They're, or, they're oh, taking man. all your money." Or "Oh man, OBS totally causes cancer. Don't build them." <laughs> oh man, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Oh, some, I'm, some, I'm no, stealing no, that one. But it's true. Some gorge told me, right? Did he really? I, yeah. I was, you know, I was running away. You know, they were totally raping our IP. And I get, I find this gorge. He's like, man, the OBS cause cancer. Why do you think I look like this? <laughs> I used to be one of you. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'd rather be a gorge. <laughs> anyway, did I derail you? <laughs> yeah. I got to steal that joke. It's so good. But I know it's, it's like the best joke. I think it's I mean it's right up there with man. Don't worry, I got you. I built an OC. All right, yeah, no, man, no, man, I got this. I got this. Can <laughs> I got it. I got this. <laughs> all right, actually, before we go any further, there's a public service announcement. I'm proud of all of you. Geek Nights listeners seem to account for about eighty percent of the NS noobs right now. Uh, yeah. The drawback is, I love you guys. You guys, for like a week, almost ruined NS for me. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know how to play NS, don't play. Well, do play, but don't play with people who know how to play because you'll ruin the game. I mean, think about a game you're really good at, right? Wait a minute, what? The, but how, how hypocritical is this? We like this really obscure game that no one else likes and we're really good at it. So we tell people how great it is. Yep. And we tell them to play it. Yep. So they come and play it and pee in the pool as a result. Yep. And now we tell them to get out of the pool. <laughs> we tell them you gotta pee in the kiddie pool first, and then you can come in the big kids' pool, and then you can come on the high dive. Kitties who pee can't go on the high dive, all right? The problem is the kiddie pool in NS is that one like marine training bot server. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys gotta, you know, there's people are in the if you go to the forum, you know, we're trying to set up a server. I think G David set up a server. Yep, right? and we are working on some tutorials, but yep. what all I, you kitties can go try to like play with each other on some empty servers or something. Don't come to our servers, don't join our games. <laughs> until unless you're good, unless Jerk. until you figured it out. Not because I don't want to play with you i do and if you actually if you guys you know do find a kiddie pool to play in maybe i'll come in the kiddie pool and you know show you how things are done but wait, wait I, I believe you mean come in the kiddie pool and shove everyone down laughing hysterically the whole time well yeah that's probably what'll happen because that's how the game works but you know it, it's imagine As if you jump into the calm drop one <laughs> shotgun and then like man yeah. rush the hive well, think of it think of it this way right pretend you're really good at oh you know, Monopoly, right? Monopoly is a game that even if people don't like it, because we don't, uh, people understand it, right? Let's say you're playing Monopoly, and you know how to play. You're really good, and everyone else sucks. That's kind of fun for a little while, because it's like, I got Boardwalk, and the other guy's like, oh, New York, I don't need to buy that. Yeah, I'll just pass on that one. Who cares? You know, oh, shit, I'm in jail. What's this get-out-of-jail-free card do? Should I use that? No, okay, I won't, you know? But... Imagine if someone who doesn't know how to play is on your team. It's like, yeah, I don't want to buy that boardwalk. What's wrong with you? Oh, my God, buy the stupid boardwalk. No, nah, I don't want to. Ah, it, it's, you know, you're going to be mad frustrated. So when you join an NS game, it's a team game. So if you're not good, you can, especially if you're an alien, Scott, Scott, you can ruin your team. Scott, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate what you just said. Get the hell off my lawn! God damn it! You ah. join the other team at least, not my team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're at, 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 at least if you're a marine, you can the most damage you can do as a marine is just keep getting killed constantly, and all that will do is give the other team some RFK. 
If you're an alien, you're getting these resource points. If you don't know how to spend them, or if you like turn into an Onos and die, you just cost your team like 75 res. Oh my God, you just hey, ruined hey, the game for everybody. Compared to Scott Johnson in Left 4 Dead. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Anyway, but the, regardless of all that, forget Of course, Scott. he did the same thing in NS too. He joined a game of NS, and he was sitting there not spending his res, and then... He sort of, he turned into a gorge, built some things, and then left when he realized he forgot how to play. <laughs> I've, whenever I'm going to leave a game and I have a res, I always turn into a gorge, build a bunch of stuff, and then leave. I figure, leave a nice parting shot for my friends. Yeah, you got to do something like that. Or just, oh no, it's rush and die, and then leave. At least be a lurk and spray a bunch. But, no, that's a long-term strategy, not a short-term. <laughs> or at least, anyway, this, uh, this article reeks of trying to tie Barack Obama's name into a video game article for uh, good press and linkage. Uh. But basically, the gist of this article is that, yes, with Barack Obama in power, maybe we can save the video game industry. And I don't know about that. No, here are two of the points this guy makes. One, we have to save the middleware developers. Okay. From being bought out by the game developers. The middleware developers are the unsung heroes, but no one knows who they are. And they should get tax cuts in order to remain independent. What? And this one, this should have not... They're what politics. does that do with Barack Obama doesn't give a shit about this? No, they're saying that the po politicians and the government should intercede in the video game industry to foster a better environment for it. And maybe in, the weak, maybe in no, France or Canada. The weak sauce tie to Barack Obama is that he's a new president. Maybe he'll do this stuff. But the, the one that bothers <laughs> what, why me Why are you more, even talking, giving recognition to the shitty article we now have to link to? Because I want to talk about an issue that they bring up. Because right. this has come up a lot, and I talked about it, I think, last time. But he basically says, we need to crack down on the secondary market. People who make games uh... should get mandatory legal compensation every time the game changes hands in the secondary market. Fail. And the government should regulate this with uh, the equivalent of a blue book. And at the same time, price controls to make sure that the secondary market that is regulated doesn't gouge anyone? Fail. Well, I mean, aside from the obvious argument of anytime someone creates IP, I mean, I think everyone agrees that if you create intellectual property, you need to be compensated in a reasonable way. Otherwise, the incentive to create intellectual property or the ability to raise money to create high-budget intellectual property basically goes down the toilet and nothing else gets made. Well, unless we go back to the old school patron system, which, you know, has infinity problems. Well, yes, because then... The, problem, the, the real thing is we have two systems, the patron system and the copyright system, and both of them have infinity problems each. So what do you do? But the thing is, the, I think the free market compensation system works a lot better. The only problem with IP is that the compensation system is set to where you can make one thing and expect a profit off of it for 90 years. Yeah. But anyway, why do people treat the video game secondary market so differently from everything else? Their I mean, used bookstores are off, you know, authors are still not complaining about it. Yeah, used CD stores have always been a big hit. There's, I can buy a used car. <gasps> There's no regulation. Are used, used cars are the reason that, you know, they should just ban the sale of used cars. Then Detroit will be saved. Uh, I saw someone argue that non-ironically. What the fuck? What the fuck? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like the video game industry has this weird relationship with politics in that Politicians, especially in America and Australia and Britain, seem to really, really, really like meddle in the video game industry a lot. Yet they don't meddle at nearly the same level in all the other kinds of IP. They don't come down on violent movies nearly as hard as they do in violent video games. They don't come down on, I mean, a boob in a movie. All right, that's okay nowadays. It's but, no, you know, back in the day, they came down hard on the rock music. And then now the people in charge are the rock music. So as soon as the people in charge are the video games, they won't come down on it anymore. It's the history of the world. It can't be changed. That's uh, no, how things are. The problem here is that technology is moving a lot faster than it used to. And video games have gone from nothing to niche to mature, wide market audience long, long before that change. I mean, the rock and roll revolution and the movie industry revolution, the technology and the advancement of movies just went more slowly. Look how far video games have come in the last, I don't know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And yet the politics have gotten more restrictive and even worse. 
Well, I don't know what to do about it. But at the same time, we've got people like this guy, and he's not the only one. Like, they don't want the politicians stepping on their freedom of speech and regulating their industry, except when the regulation makes them more money. And then they really, really, that's really how, want. That's how everyone, you know, that, that's the difference between someone who has a, you know, political science principle and someone who just is looking out for their own you know self-interest right someone like me if you ask me a question right to i'll give you an answer such as you know i don't care what regulation you want right there shouldn't there should be less regulation on video games period right but someone else will come in and they'll be like you know i don't care about your political principles your ideologies the constitution you know if it's good for me it, you know it's good if it's bad for me it's bad like there was a i was reading a thread in a for a superhero forum and they were like what if there really were vigilantes and a lot of people are like yeah as long as they only go after the criminals yeah beat the shit out of them criminals and i'm like uh how about the principle of you know innocent until proven guilty no but to play the uh <laughs> the devil's advocate there are two ways to look at american democracy on one hand there's the political science view of you strive for the political ideology and political framework wherein the reasonable debate and the decision making can happen the other way to look at it is that it is an adversarial system and you should use every instrument provided to you by law within the system to get these specific issue things that you want for your best interest accomplished in the hopes that the varied and competing self-interest balance out. And our government system is based very heavily on that principle. I mean, look at our balance of powers. We have three different branches that each have the power to screw the other two. It's like a giant democratic yeah. paper rock scissors. Yes, but the two things can work together. You know, if you have a strong... Well, they do. That's called American democracy. Yeah. But if you, have a, if you have a strong, you know, political principle underlying everything, there is still plenty of room for debate on specific issues. You know, I mean, the, you know, if you say Congress has this power, yes, they do. Okay, that question is answered. They could still choose to do this or that, and you have your, you know, your specific issue debate going on. To quote, perhaps it's my own personal audacity of hope at work here that President-elect Obama will care enough about our industry's plights to create, introduce, or sign into law legislation that will benefit us as a business. Or maybe it's audacious enough to suggest that he'll even have the time to address these issues as America tries to pull itself together in the midst of everything that's going wrong. Uh, how about video games like the last thing on the list? And two, you're better off writing like your congressman. Obama doesn't give a shit and there's not much he can do unless Congress does something first. Uh, even if this was a good idea, which it is not. It's not. This, <laughs> who wrote this article? Give me a second. Who actually wrote this? A uh, retard. Nick Michetti. Not smart. I don't know who Nick Machetti is, and he is the something, something combo I give up. Because it's time for things of the day. Oh, shit, do I have a thing of the day? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, well, I got two because they're both kind of lame. On one hand, the concepts behind them both are awesome. On the other hand, the actual reality of what has been done not so great because I learned one thing almost every left for dead video on YouTube has stupid music just like added to it. Uh, ruining no, it. You, uh, you can remove a word from that sentence and it would still be true. Every left for dead on YouTube, no, every video on YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, two things stood out one, someone remade CS Office. In Left 4 Dead. I think that's pretty cool. I like that, actually. I want to see more of that. I want to see, see CS Estate on Left 4 Dead. Yes, because remember that mod for CS, the zombie mod, that was actually very similar to uh, Left 4 Dead and very, very bit, fun. A little bit. The concept of you got some humans fighting co-op and just hordes and hordes and hordes of, al of aliens, zombies coming at you. And you mm -hmm. got to hole up and then win. But um, number two, Left for Dead and Counter Strike. You can also tell that you know Counter Strike. People don't realize Counter Strike originally was a free mod for Half Life One, uh, made by some dudes, and then those dudes got bought by Valve, and that's why Counter Strike isn't free anymore. It is clear if you have ever played Counter Strike when you play Left for Dead, it is clear that the Counter Strike team made Left for Dead. You can tell by the way the weapons work. There is there is no question about it. But anyway, I saw this and I thought, oh. That's clever. And then, I, you know, I mourn the loss of CS Thunder and all these sorts of things. But then I thought, hey. Yeah, there's, one, there's that one map uh, in Left 4 Dead that really reminds me of DE Vertigo. Oh, man. That was the one where I was the tank. But anyway, 
And you punched someone off the building? I punched three people off the building. Oh, man. It was great. It was great. But uh, item two, I thought, hey, we should make a Leroy Jenkins video in Left 4 Dead. And then I thought, hmm, I wonder if anyone yeah, else Yeah, because, I mean, it. you got that whole thing with the witch and everything and the boomer. If someone just said, Leroy Jenkins, and ran in and got boomed and then w- woke the witch up, that would totally be funny. So what I link to is the best one that is out there. Someone made a... The best Left 4 Dead Leroy Jenkins video that has been It's made. still not a good video, but it's the best one. Yeah, so uh, I implore all of you. The least get, smelly poop. If you, someone out there, I don't have time, make a Leroy Jenkins Left 4 Dead video. But if you do it, use the audio from the original one. Don't put any music over it. Yes. Just have some people talking. This is how the video goes, ready? Some people are talking, right, in the game. Got so it. Then one guy isn't moving. As they're talking, the guy goes... All right, let's do this. Leroy, Leroy Jenkins. Jenkins. And he runs out, uh, well, and he well, wakes up the witch, gets boomed, and uses a Molotov and sets himself on fire all at the same time. Now, you need the key. To, there are two key elements. Well, actually, there are three key elements. Someone then has to say, God damn it, Leroy. There are exactly three key elements. One, after he runs in, there's a moment of silence of about three seconds, followed by some the guy who was talking saying, did he just run in there? Two, you need, as everyone else runs in, the shot of Leroy on fire running back toward the party. Getting hit by a witch covered in vomit. <laughs> and three, you need the long scene of everyone dying. Yep. You all see. <laughs> it's not my fault, guys. <laughs> At least uh, I got chicken. I got chicken. Or uh, I'm not chicken. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, remember when Leroy Jenkins was fresh? Yeah. Remember that Otakon where you could walk around Otakon, yell Leroy, and like a thousand people would yell Jenkins back at you? Oh, that was a good Otakon, that one. Yeah. We need some more. Someone needs to make more memes that have those sort of call outs in them, you know, where we can yell something and then someone will say the, the other part. Yeah. Anyway. So check out this thing of the day in keeping with my Thanksgiving yummies. What do you do on Thanksgiving? I eat my weight in turkey. Well, here you can eat far less than your weight in turkey. It's a paper craft turkey. That's it. That's it? That's it. It's a paper craft turkey. And you know what the best part is? It has those little chef's hats on the on the drumsticks. <laughs> I love those. You know, I've never actually seen those in real life, but I keep seeing them like whenever someone draws like a Thanksgiving turkey, they always have them. But in real life, I've never seen one. You know what those are for? See, easier to hold the drumstick without getting your hand dirty? Yes. Even though I just I just use a napkin. You do know, do you realize there is a tradition in Detroit with the lions on Thanksgiving involving a turkey? Uh, they, don't they have one at the game or something? And well, what they do is, one, there are the traditions, it's, it's gaming day, we don't just talk about video games. Real briefly, the Detroit tradition for Thanksgiving is such. One, they will have a home game where they wear their old away uniforms. Mm-hmm. The old, old, old ones. Two... At halftime, they'll bring out a turkey with N drumsticks attached to it. (laughs) And people bet on how many drumsticks there will be. (laughs) Three, they'll be up by at least 14 by the and then lose it in the last eight minutes. Well, well, Ram, I have I have some sad news for you. You ready for this sad news? Mm -hmm. Number one, the Lions so far this year are winless. I don't think any NFL team has ever gone the entire season without winning. Hey, 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 if anyone can do it, we can. Right. Well, secondly, uh, you just said, you know, the Lions are going to be up and then lose it at the end. Oh, they're going to be up on Thanksgiving. They Um, always are. The Lions are playing this uh, on this Thursday, the Tennessee Titans, the best team in the AFC. They're going to get killed from the start to the end. It's going to be a slaughter. I don't think you understand the magic. You see, the Lions can only do well when they're about to be crushed. And the more they're about to be crushed, the better they will do in the beginning. And the third news is that there is talk going on of ending, uh, you know, because Detroit sucks so bad and no one wants to watch them. Right. I mean, I, a guy on the internet, (laughs) a guy on the internet was talking about how he got, you know, uh, you know, 50 yard line tickets real close, real easily. To hey, the- if I lived in Detroit, I would totally go to Lions games all the time. Because yeah. well, you can get the season tickets real cheap. If, you, if you've got a really good sports team, it's awesome. And if you've got a, a really bad sports team, it's awesome because you got something to talk about. Well, you have, you know, this is like I went uh, way back a few years ago, many years ago, actually, to uh, a New England Patriots game, right? When they were kind of good, maybe, you know, not re- not super recently. Um, 
And it was like the first home game that they had lost in a very long time. Like at that point in time, they hadn't lost a home game in like a year or so. And uh, I think they might have won the Super Bowl the previous year. I don't remember. And like walking out of there, because if you've ever been to that stadium, it's this long road to back to your car. And they basically turn the road into a one way road. And then during the game, they switch it to one way in the other direction so people can get in and out. It was just like this quiet, like, it was like a funeral march out of there. You know, I didn't care. I'm a Giants fan. Well, I give a shit. But it was very, you know, in Detroit, they don't know what winning's like. So if they won, they just wouldn't know what to do. But when they lose, they're just like, yeah, another loss. Woo! Well, the thing is, the, the they philosophy. They relish in losing. The philosophy of Detroit is that you have to balance good teams with bad teams. Mm. That's why the Red Wings and the Pistons are so great. Because we have the Tigers <laughs> and the Lions. <laughs> Tigers are middling. Yeah, they're better now than they were when I was a they're kid. They're middling. They're not great, but they're middling. Oh, um, my God, when I was a kid. All right. Left for dead. Oh, but there's talk of ending the tradition of uh, letting the Lions have always the Thanksgiving game and giving it to someone people actually want to see. Detroit would riot. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Anyway, <laughs> left for dead. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to say right now, if you're looking for the quick review, one, it's great. Two, buy it as soon as possible because it doesn't have staying power. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Left 4 Dead is a great zombie game, you know, but there is a question as to how long the game will hold our interest, you know, or anyone's interest. And I think Tycho from it, Penny Arcade agrees. I give the game, for me personally, it's got no more than two months to go before yeah. I'm done with it. I mean, the game only has like four campaigns, right? So after you do those four campaigns, maybe you can replay them on a harder difficulty level, right? And maybe there's two campaigns you can play in versus mode. You can't play all four campaigns in versus mode, but you can play two of them in versus mode. So it might be worth it to replay the campaigns, both of the ones, in versus mode. Once you've done that, and you've done it all in co-op and such, what is there really you know more to the game maybe if you decide you want to play the versus mode competitively and like make a team and like compete in tournaments or something and some sort of clan thing maybe it'll have a little bit more replay value maybe because it has the one added benefit i mean the fact that because you play as a team of four i found that pretty much you'll find a group of four who's really good that you work together with and you'll just play with them all the time. So the game really lends itself to team-based, you know, pod ladder play. Yep. However, even if I get into that, and there's a tiny chance I will, but even if I decide to go all the way, I play Left 4 Dead, like, as much as you can play. I join the ladders, I join one of those clans or whatever that's going to be propping up. Well, even then, I can't see myself playing the game more than six months. Yeah, there's also, you know, if user-generated maps start coming out and being easier to play and load up and whatnot. Even like the though one, the, the first, I don't know, five are going to be terrible. Yeah, I mean, people are making the mall from da Dawn of the Dead, which is an obvious idea, right? You know, uh, they, you just saw one that was, what, DE Office, right? Oh, CES Office. DE Office. D we should make DE Office. It'd be hilarious. Huh? <laughs> CES Office, you know, if enough maps come out, maybe it could hold your interest a little longer. Maybe a Valve releases some more campaigns, you know, like, hey, here's a new campaign. Even if the new campaign was like five bucks, see, I would pay five bucks for a, a full Left 4 Dead campaign. Here's my worry. I had not, I mean, I didn't play the game until recently. I actually didn't play it at all until a few nights, you know, a couple nights ago, a few nights ago, where Scott and I and two forum mites got together, and we just went right into the advanced campaign and just kind of trivially went through beating it. Like, yep. no difficulty at all. Like, it didn't even, there was no question. Nobody of died, ever. Because we worked together, we were all smart, none of us had lag, we all had skill, we beat it. So obviously we have to just play an expert, but the thing is, there's a limited number of game mechanics in Left 4 Dead. I mean, it's basically every map the way it is now because you can't interact with the environment. The game really doesn't have enough Half-Life 2. That's that's really one thing that's bothered me about every Source Engine game. That's Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike Source, and Left 4 Dead. These are all on the Source Engine, right? The same Source Engine that is used in Half-Life 2 with all the crazy physics of picking up barrels and throwing soda cans and gravity guns, right? Now, I understand why... Portal doesn't even have any of the physics engine stuff. I understand why Team Fortress 2 doesn't, because it's this really stateless, non-narrative kind of... Well, it's not stateless anymore. Thank you, achievements. But anyway, it's a game that's supposed to be a direct competition, and adding all that stuff would make it a lot fuzzier, and the maps, you know, they wouldn't be as clean. But for a game like this, where it's kind of a single-player co-op 
you know, narrative beat the game, meet this objective thing, it really could be just like yep. a co-op Half-Life. And the the re the moment I realized this was that we were playing the Dead Air campaign. We were playing, and you have the, there's this crane. Remember in Half-Life Two, there was a crane, and what you had to do with this crane is you had to pick up a shipping crate and basically put it down. Oh no! You had to pick up your car and put it down up top where you could, you know, that way you could drive to but the no, next no, area. No, 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 no! You know what you did? First, you picked up a cargo container, swung it as fast as you could, and threw it at some people. Then you went knocking troops off of bridges, and then you swung stuff around. And you played there for like a half hour. Yep. In Left for Dead, the crane—you basically get in the crane, pull the lever, then you defend the crane from zombies and survive for like a minute or so. And then the crane just automatically does its thing and creates a bridge so that you can go to the next area. Yeah, the, the, Why can't I use the crane to swing around and knock the zombies off the building? Just think about that. That would have been the best thing ever. If in that scene, the person who was in the crane could just start swinging that container around, just like knocking zombies off left and right, that would have, that would have made this game immortal. Yeah. That would... Having the Half-Life 2 If you stuff. could, you know, I mean, in this game, a, a good strategy is whenever you, especially if you're playing Versus, is to close doors behind you. Because it's, zombies can go through doors, but they have to break them first, so it slows them down. You know, and if uh, someone on the other team decides to spawn behind you, and you close a door behind you, you can get away from them and force them to, you know, spawn again or whatever. And, um... Imagine if, like in Half-Life 2, you could pick up items and put them down, or pick up items and throw them, right? You could pick up items and sort of put them in front of the doors to make little barricades and things. Instead, you know, barricades, like, just sort of appear on their own, like, whenever you start a new section of a campaign, like, a barricade just appears in the safe room on its own, like the people had built it when the screen was, well, that's you what know, really bothers me. I mean, it, it's better from a kind of straight-up gameplay perspective in that the game is really clean, and really simple and really predictable. I mean, and this adds a lot of atmosphere. I mean, you have the different musical cues when different things are about to happen, and you kind of, you go into every game expecting certain things, but because of that, and because it's basically just a pop-up book with zombie fights, I mean, you go to a place, you hit the button to make the pop-up book thing happen, and then you do the fight, and then you move on, hit the next pop-up book thing, and, you know, every map is go in, there's going to be smokers and boomers and things, Oh, now here's the part where we fight the tank, and then we continue. You're waiting for it. You can only make so many campaigns where, until you've exhausted every possible novel game mechanic that the game presents. And then the only thing a campaign can add is narrative and color. And at that point, the game's not going to have anything else to offer to yeah. most people. I mean, the one thing the game does have is the so-called director, you know, the AI director, where, you know, the game plays it up like each campaign is a movie and you're acting in the movie, you know, the a zombie movie. And, you know, the director sort of, you know, every time you play a campaign, it's not exactly the same. Like, if you play Half-Life 2... The, there's the same number of bad guys in every spot every time. You now, know? this idea that room always has one of those poison head crabs in it. You this know? idea was brilliant because it it lets the game, even if you play through a campaign a second time, keep that kind of aura of suspense that you can't. I mean, if it was exactly the same every time, like most FPSs have been up to this point, it would it would be the game of I memorized it and I can speed run it. Yep. But no, the director sort of changes the flow of the game as you go on. So if like you sit in one place and don't move, like zombies will sort of keep coming at you if you don't start moving. You know, they'll be like another flood of zombies. Oh my god, one of them saw you, right? Or you know, maybe sometime you'll go through. There'll be a witch in this spot, but maybe the witch will be in a different spot, or maybe there won't be a witch. There'll be a tank. Maybe there'll be two tanks. Maybe you know, and it's sort of the game throws. You know, the bad guys at you as if there was a director, you know, a, a, a real director sort of deciding and controlling the flow of the action. But it's just an AI controlling the flow of the action. The game does a really good job of keeping the atmosphere right and balancing hectic times with quiet, scary times. Yeah, I think if you play an expert, though, there's a lot less quiet times. Yeah. But in advanced, you know, the, the, at least the balance for cinematic purposes is just right. But it's not hard enough, and we just beat it every time. Yeah, but I just I feel like there's so little long term play the game has to offer that even if they have DLC, I'm using it downloadable content, and I can buy campaigns. I feel like every the campaigns that came with the game 
have already exhausted every possible game mechanic unless they add game mechanics. And, and they would need to make campaigns that were sort of different or longer or better. Or I mean, the other thing that gets me about the campaigns is that they're a little bit like too linear, right? I mean, sometimes you have a choice of like go the back way or go the front way, but you don't really have a choice. Like I want like have a campaign where maybe if I go, I can like you know, get to a boat, or maybe if I go this way, we can get to a train, or maybe, you know, or maybe there's, like, a vehicle we can ride in, or we can sort of take the rooftops, maybe. Like, a big decision. That way, even a single campaign has a lot of replay value. And that's another thing. Where's the vehicle? I mean, usually, people go, oh, vehicle mission. Zombie needs a vehicle mission. Oh Zombie game needs a vehicle mission. One guy drives the van, everyone else shoots out the sides. Where is it? I can't find it. That would it. be great, because think about it. Here's the cinematic scene you set up. You get in the van, you start driving. A tank runs up from the side and knocks the van the fuck over. Oh, that's hot. You're in it, everything's chaos and spinning, and then there, the, the only there. thing is this one scene where you come out into the back of this garage, and Francis goes, I hate vans. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I go into that room, I go, I hate vans. <laughs> Just to, to demonstrate that I've memorized the line. See, that's the other thing I like. The characters are great like the the, cin- good. the cinematics of the game like the opening movie is brilliant because on one hand it's a pretty good zombie movie in and of itself and it on the other hand it introduces the characters the plot and every single game mechanic like yep. right then you watch that opening movie you know what all the zombie types are you know what to do about them you know all the game mechanics you know pi- what pipe bombs do and it's basically a tutorial that doesn't act like a tutorial. More mm-hmm. games need that. Another thing that is sort of weird, though, while the game has these four characters, right? Zoe, Francis, Bill, and Lewis, right? Um, and they sort of fit the stereotypes of characters in a zombie movie. You know, the grizzled vet, the biker dude, the token black guy, and the girl, <laughs> right? And, you know, typical zombie movie. That's a, that's how it goes. Um you, it lets you choose which character you want to be, but it doesn't really make a difference. They're all exactly the same. They all move at the same speed. They have the same HP. They have the same, you know, you pick whatever weapon you want. They're all the same accuracy. And I think that was a missed opportunity to increase the replay value even more. If the characters were different in some way, you know, maybe the grizzled vet ha- is better aim. And uh, maybe Francis has better melee attacks. Um, and it's harder for like smokers to grab him or something, or, you know, Lewis can carry a lot more stuff and, uh, maybe the girl is faster and she can duck and maybe roll or jump farther and stuff like that. You know <laughs> what? Black zombie killer needs med pack badly. No. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. I'm sorry. You know, that would have increased the replay value fourfold. Cause I'd want to play through as each character, yep. you know, each time. Plus, but now that little thing, even if they were really, really, really subtle differences would have just added that feeling. You know, yeah, I mean, like one person can carry two med packs. One person can carry a little bit more ammo, you know, just a little, even if it was a little tiny difference between the characters, it would make a big difference in the game. Hey, if only someone could make a mod where it's just, you play left for dead, but you pick everyone picks a team fortress two class. <laughs> and you just go. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I just pick the scout and run to the safe room and close the door. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Engineer could be fun. Everyone could be fun except the spy. Well, I think the heavy would get uh, owned. He wouldn't have a chance. I mean, Maybe. he'd mow him down, but then he would get overrun. He he'd have be to able tweak to make the game. It. But I don't know. The game, the single player game, is not going to have staying power. So that's why I said if you want to play this game. Play it now, because everyone who's into it now, the player base is going to drop off like a rock within a year. This is going to be one of those situations where if you weren't in at the ground floor, you're really going to miss out because by the time you decide to play a year from now, no one's going to be playing and no yeah, well, one good's going to be there. If you get, say, the 360 version, right, you can play it with people in your house. So if you have friends who also haven't played it and you can get them together, you know, all you need is four people. And if you've got four people that haven't played, you can play any time. But if you want to play it with the people who are playing it now, right, the people who got into the ground floor, the, we're going to be bored of this game in like a month or so, and then we're not going to play it anymore. So if you want to play, you know, you with co-op with, and you don't have three friends who also have not played, you, now is the time. You got to pay the 50 bucks and get on that. Now also, 
you know, th- there is a 360 in PS3. I think there's a PS3. I don't know. There's definitely a 360 version. And really, though, you should play the PC version. Yeah, you definitely should. Yeah, I, I, you know, the 360 version, People, th- there's other problems with it. And also, you know, Valve just tends to give a lot more respect to... I mean, think about this, right? The demo for Left 4 Dead got three patches in one day. 360 version didn't get shit, right? So... The PC is where the love is going to be from Valve. This is where you're going to get your extra maps. This is where you're going to get your mods. This is where you're going to get all the good stuff. So really any Valve game you should play on the PC. You know, get Steam. Get, just go. For, just play on the 360 unless you don't have a good PC and you do have a 360. There's really no reason to get that version. Plus, the 360 version is more money. I mean... I pre-ordered the PC version for $45. The 360 version is $60, and you're getting less. What the hell? I don't know. All right. So before we really talk about the multiplayer, we need to tell the tale of the... Because the first time I ever played multiplayer was right after the first time I'd ever played the game, which was the game that I'm talking about right now. It was me and Scott, and who was it who was with us? Classic and someone else. All right, remind Sorry, us. Sorry, someone else. Yeah, you guys were great. Maybe it was Tay Dan Pilot or Bronze Dragon or... Or Ta, I don't remember. Yeah, th- th- there's some people playing with us. They're all cool. Yeah, and there were people on the opposite team. But we we you know we decided to play the verses because we have played out the single player right then and we're feeling it. We got a good group going. Well, the co-op. Well, I, I call it the single player because it's basically... While it's a co-op game, it's re- it plays like a single player game. Yep. I mean, your friends are basically just advanced AI. <laughs> <laughs> well, they talk to you, which is nice. Occasionally. Hmm. But, uh, so we decided to play the Versus. And the Versus works okay. I mean, it's it's really The Versus not... is pretty clever. But... It is, but it's not super fun to play with the zombies. Well, the thing is, is the way that the Versus works, just for people who don't know, is uh, it's not like some other zombie games where it's like, oh, you're a survivor, but you get bit and you're turned into a zombie. No, no, no. You have a team of four people who are the survivors and they're trying to beat the mission as, you know, as they would in a normal game. And then the other four people are the zombies. And they're basically, instead of the AI director controlling the smokers and other specialized zombies, you have humans controlling the specialized zombies. Just not the witch, though, but the other ones. And, um, you know, basically... You're trying to get to the end as quickly as possible and with the most health as possible. And the zombies are trying to make it as hard as possible for the other team. And then after one team does, you know, does their thing and either succeeds or fails, you switch. So it's basically who can, you know, play the game better as survivors and who can make the game harder for the survivors as zombies. And so it's sort of team versus team at playing the normal game. It's really... I can't come up with a better way to handle it, and it, it works really, really well. It was. It was a clever idea that I would not have come up with. The only problem is that, basically, if you're good at the game, you will not have fun because the majority of people are bad at the game. And Yeah, every our- time I played a game, I tried to play Versus just by joining online games with people with strangers, and every time I was either on a team that was so good we just won, or on a team that was, most of the time, I was on a team that was so shitty I couldn't win no matter how good I was. Yeah, it's, well, in general, this is really a game where playing with strangers is not rewarding. I mean, you can play with strangers, and you can make friends and all that, but if you really want to enjoy this game, you really should play it with friends of yours, or, like, the set group of people, or have, like, a circle of maybe 12 friends who all take turns playing with each other, because if you're not playing with friends, you're going to miss most of the magic of this game. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the multiplayer... The four of us went into the multiplayer against four other people. And uh, I think we were the zombies first. And uh, they didn't make it 20 feet off that safe room door. They didn't make it at all. Uh, I think the saddest part was when their score broke double digits. Because yeah, they had a, their score. Basically, you get a score based on how much health and how far you got through the level and how difficult the level was and all these factors. And their score was like ding, 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 eight. 11. I was like, no, they broke into double digits, those fuckers. So then it's our turn, and we literally just kind of run at full speed through the map, killing all the zombies straight for the exit, taking no damage. We got 4,000 points. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, so uh, round and two. And the other problem, right, is that this happens, right? One team is good, one team is bad. So what happens here? People on the team that is losing leave because it's not fun to lose. Everyone on the losing team quit immediately, except for Bronze Dragon. You get mad props for sticking to the and end. And he had wicked lag, too. Yeah. Right? Here's, another, here's, some of, here's the problems that fold out of this. Problem number one, if you join a game online randomly... Where are there going to be empty slots on losing teams, right? Teams that have just, and which means you're against a good team, which means you're going to lose. You can't carry the team on your own. You need three other good players. Problem number two, if you're a winning team, a winning team spends a lot of time playing as survivors because they probably make it to the end of the level. And when they're zombies, they end it real quick. So a winning team plays a lot of survivor and very little zombie. A losing team plays very little survivor and a lot of zombie. Zombies can be fun, you know, smoking people and, you know, barfing on people and all that good stuff. Get being the tank is super fun. But when you're the zombies, right? You're spending a lot of time dying cuz you die very quickly and trying to find a spot to spawn, waiting to enter spawn mode. It's it's more boring overall. There's a lot of waiting and a lot of doing nothing. Whereas in your survivor, you're playing constantly. Plus, imagine how unfun it'll be. You're playing against a good team. So basically, they see you, you die. You grab someone. You have to wait they 30 stop you. seconds before you can play again. Then you see, then you join, you spawn, you attack, maybe you get some damage on, you die. You wait 30 seconds to do it again. So, really, the only way to play the multiplayer where it's fun is either to. Form a team of four and play against another formed team of four that will not rage quit. That is also good. Or, or at least similar in skill level. Mm -hmm. Or join the professional ladder play. Yeah, or something. I don't know. But yeah, that's that's a serious flaw in the versus I mode. Say, Even though, though the versus mode is pretty fun when it, when it works. Being the tank and that vertigo map was like the best thing ever. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, that's another flaw in the versus mode. I just run up to a survivor, and I'm like, punt, and just beep. So let's say you're playing versus mode, right? And it's four on four, all right? Um, you have to, in order to win as the zombies, you need to kill all four of the other players. Let's say it's four on one in versus mode, all right? Well, it's one real player and three AI players. You only have to kill the real player, and then you win. So it's actually completely unfair, because... You know, if you have less players, you are at an extreme disadvantage to where three of your players don't even count. Just one of them dies and it's game over. Well, I think the idea is that you're only going to have AI there temporarily until someone else joins your losing team and then rage quits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rage quitting is a big problem, so... It is. Yeah. I don't know. The, I mean, what can I say? The game is really fun, but it has enough flaws to where... I, I'm not going to be playing this come February. No, but I'm glad I bought it. I am actually playing it. Yes. You know, more so than other games. I am and I'm not playing Bioshock or Fallout 3 or any other games I bought recently, but I am. I'm playing Left 4 Dead and I'm playing NS sort of in equal doses. Um, the only thing is I think a couple months from now I'll still be playing NS, but I won't still be playing Left 4 Dead. Well, the thing is, think about how much staying power NS has had. We've been playing six years. NS continuously for six years. Years. Yep. Six years. No, oh, that's a long. Left for Dead is not a six-year game. Left for Dead is not a six-month game. I, I want to make a. I want to make a parody of Left for Dead called Right to Live. <laughs> what kind of game is that going to be? It's going to be your zombie trying to turn back into a human. So what? You run up to humans going, "Please help!" And then they shoot you, and it's Maybe like, "No." <laughs> Though. I have to give a very important public service announcement, and I mean this with all the love I can because this is a dear friend of mine, one of the chorist and most stalwart members of the Front Row crew, the spine that was forged in steel and iron, the man who gave us Cowboy Bebop, but Scott Johnson is possibly the most dangerous person to ever have on your team in Left 4 Dead. He is terrible. Now, for someone who likes zombies and zombie movies so much, for someone who will talk, you know, who loves doing the old zombie survival discussions, he's really bad at Left 4 Dead. I love you, Scott Johnson. You're terrible. No, I love you, but... Well, I hadn't even played Left 4 Dead yet. I didn't even know how it worked. I hadn't read anything, done anything. Scott's playing in his room. I walk in, me and Emily are standing there watching. 
we see Scott. He sees a witch. And he, I see the witch on Scott's screen. And Scott says, hey, everyone, there's a witch right here. I'm looking at it. Uh, just walk past it. It won't notice us. Scott backs away. He turns around. We see Scott Johnson go, oh, do, 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 run straight for the witch, stand on top of it, and start shooting it. Uh, Luckily, Scott shot him dead. <laughs> yep, I, I, I kept my word, and I shot Scott Johnson dead because... I was role playing. You know that is one thing that Left for Dead actually has is role playing ability, right? A lot, there are a lot of people who will role play in the game. It's kind of cool. Yeah, th- th- there's some videos of it of uh, like good people doing it well. Also, there and I basically said, "Holy shit, this guy is dangerous. He may be not a zombie, but he's going up and waking up witches. This is not someone that I can be with." And I shot him dead because there's friendly fire in the game, which is totally cool. Um, then. Right, playing with Scott. Uh, we're playing a game. Well, we start. He see he appeared out of nowhere. He's kind of like the tank. You're playing a game, and suddenly there's a Scott Johnson. Yeah, we were playing, and someone in our you know party dropped out, and Scott Johnson just sort of joined in on his own. Immediately, he, we didn't know the way what... Steam has has pretty good handling of the friends Steam system and integration with Left 4 Dead. So if you j- have friends on Steam, it's very easy to get into games of Left 4 Dead with them, and that's great. So Scott Johnson used that ability to join our Scott game of Johnson Left 4 Dead. Scott Johnson used that ability to kill us all. Basically, if I was he joined our game of my, Left 4 Dead. My words would have been, Scott, right? you've killed us all. So he joins He joins this game of Left 4 Dead that we're playing. And this me, Rim, and Classic, we're, now, doing, now, we're doing great. I think the game Scott Johnson was playing was not Left 4 Dead. He was playing... How much damage to the party can I do in 20 seconds? So the first, so he he's comes in, he's playing normally, he's playing normally. The first thing he does, he comes up and he starts to heal me. Now, I had yellow health, but everyone else had green, but I still had like 30-something health. I did not need healing yet. He starts healing me, and I'm like, get the fuck off of me. I don't want your stupid healing. Get off. There's no way to get him off of you. I tried to shoot him. <laughs> there was no way to make him stop. He wasted one of our health packs now, too early by healing me. Now, that's fine. I mean... That's, That's not fine. too bad. That wouldn't. That that alone it's is still like, bad. Well, know. whatever. Because I mean, I've wasted Molotovs. I waste things all the time. But well, I, I waste Molotovs sometimes. But the fact that Scott health packs a little more precious. Scott Johnson immediately after doing this, like literally, you you join the game, you waste the health pack, and then you turn toward a boomer and basically jump it as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a ladder, and there's a boomer <laughs> coming up the ladder. I saw it there, so I hit it with the melee attack. And I back and it fell down the ladder and I started to back off and I pulled out my pistol and I was like, boomer, boomer on the ladder. Get away, get away. Scott Johnson runs right at it. The boomer comes up the ladder and explodes on him because he shot it when he was standing right next to it. (laughs) It was it was beautiful. uh, He might be able to. It was literally it was like he joins med pack boomer vote to kick vote passes. Yeah. That's one thing. It does have a good, you know, there's a good voting system where you can vote to kick players off your team and all that. So if you have an AFK, you can just sort of stick around in the safe room, vote them out, you know, and get the AI to come in, which is better than an AFK at least, Um, and stuff like that. But um, he might be able to make an excuse that, you know, he was doing it on purpose or something like that, which is possible. But if that is the case, that means he should be able, if he was doing that on purpose, then... He needs to prove that he doesn't suck by playing well. So if his in his, if in his attempt to play well he fails, then he was obviously uh, not doing poorly on purpose. And that that's it. That's it. He so he has a <laughs> so, chance. So so public service announcement: Scott Johnson is the MD of Left for Dead. Do not play Left for Dead with Scott Johnson. <laughs> he will ruin you. I mean, think about this, right? I played Left for Dead. It was like me. Scott Johnson and two other people, you know, and I don't know, you know, I forget who the other people were, but we're doing basically um, the very first campaign on Advanced. We're just dying all over the place. Dead, 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 right? The the night or a night or two before that, I was playing the same campaign with Water is Poison and Alex and someone else. We got all the way to the end. We couldn't beat the end, but we got all the way to the end, right? Then me, Rim, Classic, and someone else played the campaign. We just got to the end and beat it. Wait a minute, I got an idea. Without dying. Scott Johnson. Same campaign, same Scott, difficulty. Scott Johnson, I have an idea. All right. An ultimatum, perhaps. A- an offer. We will never make fun of you on the show in regards to Left 4 Dead again. If you will assemble a team of four people of your choosing who are willing to play with you, 
and take Scott and I on with a team of our choosing. <laughs> Beat us at versus? Yes. That's not going to happen. Yes. They got no chance. Come on. You can train. You you give you do it sometime in like January or February. Let's do it. I'll take classic. I'll take water as poison. You we got to film win. a demo with this. This has got to be the grudge match of the century. We can't lose. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. And I know I am pre hawk trash talking as scott will attest oh, that is I, will, I will you ready i got the fucking dumpster of trash right no but if scott can, scott can attest that pre-hoc trash talk is something i don't do frequently <laughs> it is not a thing i do i will do the post talk once i know i'm going to win or once i have won the trash talk will come out about how how bad you are and how much better your mom was the night before but if i'm not sure i'm gonna win i often won't trash talk because then if i lose the trash talk is returned to me threefold, much like Wicca. Yep. Any trash talk you dispense that was not validated by victory is, uh, you know, multiplied and, you know, rich, uh, reverse direction. It's just which like Which is in why Wicca. you should not dish it, right, until you are sure that the victory will come to back it up. Of course. If you might, if you think you're going to lose... And you trash talk anyway, and you pull it off. That's like the 10x multiplier in a pinball machine. That is, that is. Because if you pre-talk, and then if you, you pre-talk, and then you win, wait, it gets wait, multiplied no. and sends forward. You could have had some interesting rhyming. If you pre-talk and walk the walk, then they can't no, ball. Aunt lame. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. Left for dead is fun, but it's not that fun. Play it while you can. And Scott Johnson sucks at it. <laughs> <laughs> This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.